Hello and welcome to Your Politics, the RTE political team's take on what's been going on in Leinster House lately and with me this Thursday on the last day of the Doyle term, but we'll be with you for a little while longer. Our correspondents, Michal Lahan and Paul Cunningham. Uh, I'm a huge fan of reality television. Um, Is this new? No, it, 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 it's I swear to God, it's my go to to cope with, you know, in between current affairs. I and did news Big and Brother politics. one and then I checked out. Uh, no, I, I'm real housewives, baby. I'm okay. down there. I'm Scandaval. I'm <laughs> all of that. But <clears throat> what we've seen at the Public Accounts Committee and mm-hmm. the Arts and Media Committee, you were saying earlier, Michal, it's actually it's three weeks now. And in a way, you had the sense today that this is what the end of the beginning, but this one will run for a good while now. Yeah, I think the conditions were set for it to be more smooth in than it actually was. Um, politicians this morning, Marco Kosig on Morning Ireland, kind of all suggesting that they were going to begin to look forward because there's a degree of fatigue here as well about it all, even though relief in government among many backbenchers that it has made their life easier for the last two we- three weeks. Uh, the issues that they would typically be talking about, there wasn't much focus on. But it was far more abrasive than expected. And I think that was for the simple reason that RT really went about contesting what Brian Tuberty's agent Noel Kelly had to say for those reasons kind of new bits and pieces emerged and there was a degree of needle in the air. But it was also on account of while RT executives had um, sent in opening statements um, last night for the Director General and also the Chair of the Board um, Adrian Lynch's statement was late and then new evidence was being produced during the um, actual hearing itself and that always narks politicians who feel how can you produce um, documentation when I haven't had the chance to look at it. And there's three points in there. Adrian Lynch kind of, Marco Kosick said he shook the hinges off the door with what he had to say. It wasn't quite that good. But what it was is he says, clearly there is a view in RT that Ryan Tuberty wouldn't have signed his big, big TV and radio contract if there wasn't that commercial deal, which on the face of it was with Renault. Equally, he says Noel Kelly, his agent, pursued payments when he knew that Renault were no longer on the park and he sc- pursued that €150,000, which, of course, Ryan Turbody now says he could pay back to RTE after all. As well as that, then there was this email uh, that seemed to show that while Noel Kelly was saying he never had a cup of tea with D Forbes, he didn't have a cup of tea, but there was direct contact between them in late April 2022. And after that, he sends an email to her saying something along the lines of good to catch up today. D, will you tell Ger, that's Geraldine O'Leary, head of commer- uh, commercial, to send down the invoice details. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's those invoices which are paid the following month in May and July that are the controversial bit, the consultancy invoices yes. and the money that ultimately makes its way to right And uh, And the key to both of those memos, if you like, the one we heard about, the email we heard about uh, from Noel Kelly the other day, the one he got from Rita O'Keefe Keith. in February, that memo he used to back up his claim that it, there was no secret about this Renault deal he in terms of paying he said, it, he said that document from the former chief financial officer of RTE showed that it's untrue to suggest that only the former director general D Forbes knew that it was widely known within the executive that um, this was the way it was going to apply. And certainly um, when uh, Mr. Kelly produced that document on Tuesday's hearing. Um, it was something that people um, like Alan Kelly said he was putting an awful lot of weight in. Now, he ripped into Mr. Kelly and other parts of his evidence, but on that key issue, on that document, he said it spoke a lot. And the point about Adrian Lynch and the memo, the rep, and again, we didn't see this email until quite late in the proceedings. TDs were uh, very exercised about that and that it was out in the media and so on and so forth. I don't think it was in the media, actually. No. I don't, that one no. actually wasn't, yeah. So... The point about that is to back up RTE's contention that this was what happened in terms of the underwriting of the deal. This is basically RTE guaranteeing it, that that was something that occurred, they say, between the former director general and Noel Kelly's agency. Is that yes. right? On the 7th of May 2020, they say that's that's when that deal was struck and in the room at that point is D Forbes uh, a solicitor, Noel Kelly and someone from his office as well. Now, Ortiz saying today too, and Richard Collins uh, pointing out that on the 30th of April, just exactly a week before, that there is a meeting that he attends where D Forbes says, no, we're not going to underwrite that. I suppose that, that's at odds with the Rita O'Keefe uh, letter and email to Noel Kelly on the February the 20th, where she says that side letter should be possible. Mm-hmm. More and than that even. You know, yeah. I'll get it, we'll yeah. provide it. Yeah. yeah, and of course, and there are people kind of CC'd on this uh, along the way as well. Yeah. Now, the head of legal, Paula Maluli, says 
that was that is not a contract that is not a nail down commitment and there's to and fro after that and the, the principle has never been conceded but there does seem to be a difference there there yeah. was quite a reaction wasn't there when uh, Rita O'Keefe the former chief financial officer of RTE who left uh, on a voluntary uh, exit package uh, again there were questions about that today but at one point even though she wasn't at the committee uh, RTE's uh, Deputy Director General, Adrian, Adrian Lynch. Uh, Interim Deputy Director Inter Sorry, General. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> you give me the titles because I just can't remember. Anyhow, they go on forever. But the point is, he tried to intervene to relay a, a correction, as far as I understand yeah, it, was it from Rita O'Keefe. I mean, it was bizarre because, sure what he'd said. because Ms O'Keefe had um, the opportunity and had been invited to attend this meeting. And clearly the members had been very impressed with her um, evidence that she'd given. Then suddenly this letter is produced by Mr. Kelly, which raises questions about her level of knowledge. And on that basis, they really wanted to talk to her. But earlier on um, this week, um, she let it be known by written letter to the committee that um, she wasn't available. She was assisting the external reviews that um, are currently organised by the media minister, um, but she also said that she had nothing add to add to her statement, um, which she'd supplied to the mm -hmm. committee the previous week. Now, that really rankled with TDs because they've got lots of questions. She mightn't feel she had anything else to add. They certainly felt she would something to add. So they were more than a little annoyed that she wasn't attending the hearing, but they had to accept it because she's not a, an RT employee. Then we're in the last hour of the four and a half hour session and Adrian Lynch interrupts with the agreement of Brian Stanley, the chair, to say that there was a clarification he wanted to make. And he starts to say, I've just been contacted by the former chief financial officer, Breedy O'Keefe. And by she text, by, by text. By text. And she wants to, and I'm going to, and before he got the chance to get to the juicy bit, it was both Rona Murphy and Brian Stanley cut him off and said it was completely inappropriate for an intervention to be made by someone outside of the committee, and more importantly, someone they'd invited and who said they couldn't turn up because they'd nothing more to add. And of course, what's different today is that Breed O'Keefe's exit package from RTE is in the spotlight. And Kevin Backer says that that particular agreement uh, was something that would have been discussed by her, who was the, for the chief financial officer at the time, and the then director general, D Forbes. And it was said later that the full executive wouldn't, didn't sign off on that. The full executive didn't sign off. So one presumes or one suspects that it's the, the intervention and the text is all about uh, putting her side of the story across there because that's where the focus has gone to. But it's important, sorry, just to clarify that because when that package was being given, it's usually on the basis in an organisation like RT is that the role is extinguished or suppressed. Or a role within, it, within the team. It doesn't exactly. have to be that exact role. Kevin Backer but has to within that, that loop has yeah. to be. And so the question was, and this was raised, by Catherine Murphy because if that bar wasn't passed then maybe the revenue commissioners might have an interest in the package which had been supplied. Mark O'Cahasi raised uh, an interesting point towards the end and he was pointing out look RTE did have systems in place they just weren't operating it did have a, a remuneration committee that wasn't meeting when it should have been uh, decisions on exit packages were supposed to be cleared by the executive board it appears from what we heard today that didn't happen. We know Breda O'Keefe disputes that. But yeah. again, a lot, we, we heard the chair, Shuni Raleigh, talk about uh, silos within RTE. You'd wonder what kind of exec, what was actually getting said at the exec board. Just because seems it doesn't this, seem to was be much. A, this was complete dysfunction. And how it developed into a story whereby individual executives were not meeting or even if they weren't meeting, they were standing up and um, the new director general, Kevin Backhurst, said it himself. He can't understand and believes it was wrong that people didn't stand up and say there's something going wrong here. Instead, the executives seemed cowed. They didn't meet individually. They didn't stand up. And this roadshow went off the cliff and left the organisation where it now is um, with this stain on this reputation. And Mr. Backhurst, when asked about these non-disclosure of um, payments, said it was absolutely disgusting. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be what how many reviews now we've got the forensic <laughs> accountant coming in so Mazars were in with the media or not with the minister but with the minister's officials today so that is going to get up and running fairly quickly we've then got the two external reviews um, one by uh, Professor and formidable Professor Neve Brennan but then you've got a parallel one which is that's on governance another one working on on the question of culture 
Um, and then you've got the two Oireachtas committees continuing to do their work. So it'll be very much interesting to see how Kevin Backris gets on because in committee today, you said repeatedly, you're going to be judged not on your words, but on your performance. Yeah. The question is, how can he perform when he's hemmed in on five sides? And we also learned today uh, substantial, substantially more than has already been provided for in terms of settling uh, for the uh, bogus self-employment uh, claims. A lot yeah, of those. I think the word was substantial, then was changed to significant, wasn't it? And then the head, of legal, good. head of legal intervened and said appropriate, an appropriate amount has been set aside. And there's also the review of um, Radi and Agueltochta pay scales, isn't that right? Yeah. And Yes, so a lot of reviews going on and they're all going to be very expensive. Again, as Kevin Backhurst uh, acknowledged, um, let's deal with his performance, uh, first of all, because he was a, a new player before these committees today. Um, turning a corner, impressing the politicians? I thought he was, um, first of all, he was forthright. He was also succinct. He didn't wander on. And when he did speak, he, he made his points clearly. Maybe it was easier for uh, an outsider coming into the middle of a mess to be able to say, mm. I disagree with everything that happened and I'm telling you now, everything is going to be changed. But nonetheless, I thought his performance was solid. And on occasions, while he clearly is a polite man, mannerly as he is, he was able to push back against politicians to finish his point. And I think there was a sort of a respect in the room for him. Yeah, and, and he really was pressed to, to express confidence in his Deputy Director General, uh, Adrian Lynch, a few times, uh, and, and he did so uh, in, in glowing terms. But I mean, that kind of was a notable indication of the tone of the meeting, that it really was quite abrasive, I think. I think, too, you, you do feel that RTE management at these committees over the last three weeks, at large parts, haven't done great at all at the very start. They didn't seem prepared for what the type of forum that it was. That first is, th those first meetings were shocking. Yeah. Uh, despite all that, and that that's definitely true, this notion that witnesses have been afforded courtesy throughout, uh, that, that, isn't, that isn't the case. I mean, it is fairly wild at times in there. There are people who have a, a set amount of time where they have to answer questions and they repeatedly uh, don't let the person who's trying to answer it answer it. They say that's because the clock's being run down and maybe it is that, but it definitely hasn't been mm -hmm. uh, quite the fair forum. But without it, so many answers that we would have never heard we wouldn't have got so it has been extremely necessary and it has done significantly good work actually the Fianna Fáil TD Paul McAuliffe gave a master class didn't he in yes. like questions and answers question it, it was it's actually actually worth going and looking back at a McAuliffe series of facts Alan Dillon a series well, of short it, answers but, yeah. style. but I thought you were absolutely right because it was around sort of lunchtime around one o'clock and Paul McAuliffe we got to the stage where we were trying to tear you know evidence out and he started to assimilate and it wasn't assimilate to get the answer. It was assimilate to define positions that they had. And I think to a certain extent, we've reached a floor with the PAC. They now know where the RT executive stands, where the board stands, where yeah. Mr. Um, Tuberty stands and his agent. And it'll be up to them now to determine, you know, what they make of it all. And given the and conflicting... They, they haven't formed a view because Imelda Munster at one point, didn't she say... <laughs> The, the committee doesn't believe you, isn't it? To, yes. to, to Adrian yeah. Lynch, Mark, Paul McAuliffe's the one who's intervened and says no such a consensus no, has been reached. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and they have to go through the whole process first before they, they reach all their proper conclusions. And of course, they can't make findings of... They can't. What, what can they not do in committee reports? Can't make findings of fact. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, and they're, so all of this is I'd going to be feeding. there'll be no systems failure. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, all of this is going to feed into <laughs> the various failure. reviews that will probably be going <laughs> on week. forever and ever and ever at this stage. Um, Don't say that. Don't say that. The end of the beginning, baby. Uh, you quote <laughs> me on that one. Um, given the very contradictory accounts we have had from Ryan Tuberty and Noel Kelly the other day and the RTE executives in terms mm -hmm. of what was understood, what was not understood, who was talking to, all the rest. The question TDs kept asking today, how can Ryan Tuberty come back? And will he come back? Will he be back before the House is back in September? That's the question, isn't it? That's where the end of the Public Accounts Committee, like, it hangs on that question. And if there is a view, I think among politicians, they say, yeah, possibly, maybe just the slightly tilting in, in his favour that he may. I mean, I think that... Um Mr. Backers won't be in a rush to take a decision. He said he's going to take some time, but not too much time. 
So that was nice and vague. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, Michal's right in talking about the timeline. If you look in the negative, if you look towards that account on Tuesday when um, uh, Verona Murphy, the independent TD, was asking Mr. Kelly were lies being told. And he said, lies, um, intentional or not, mm -hmm. I don't know. To my mind, there's only one, a lie is intentional. You can't have an unintentional lie. I mean, that's really strong language when you're talking about your mm -hmm. employers, the people who are going to be taking you back. And yet, on the other hand, um, Mr. Backers today was talking about being fair to Mr. Toberty and um, that he would take the time. There was an assessment there. He talked about the staff. He talked about the Speaking wider audience. Radio, yeah. And suddenly that was far more, um, you know, there was lots yeah. to consider. Yeah. Um, In the so, latter half of Tuesday as well, it did go from being, you know, quite waspish at at, sorry, at the early stages to be more philosophical by the end, didn't it? Ryan, Ryan Trubley talking about giving back the money if that was what yes. was required. And there was a big difference the other day because on Tuesday, Ryan Tuberty and Noel Kelly were before the two committees mm -hmm. back to back. So, so the second half was much milder, wasn't yeah, it? So they the had word the catharsis kept being in the morning used, yeah. and it was arts and media in the afternoon. Yeah. He looked about, Ryan Tuberty looked about 10 years older in the afternoon than he did when he came in that morning. Did but you know what think? I also thought? He looked more of an individual. He wasn't just completely walking in step with Mr. Kelly, his best friend and family friend and all that stuff. He, as uh, Mio put his finger on, sort of suddenly had his own view and he talked about, you know, and I think if it's the case, and he said, I know it's not guaranteed, if it's the case, then I'm prepared to publish my um, contract every year so we don't have all this hullabaloo going on. So, And I thought for, for his own purposes of achieving the aim, his stated aim of getting back on air, I thought that was better for him. And that around the 150,000, Kevin Backer's using the word today about the moral considerations as well here. So you do feel if Ryan Tuberty has to come back, he has to give 150,000. He may not be paid for a few weeks. That seems to be the, mm. the way it's looking now, that these kind of things have and, to happen. And then driving down the cost of the contract. 150,000, though, however, that was legally paid. Yes. I mean, RTE's view is that was legally paid. And Noel Kelly's and Ryan Tuberty's view is that seems to be work outstanding. And if we don't do the work, the money will go back. Yeah, but six it's events with the big turnout predicted. But six events for a company that doesn't have any six events planned because its contract only lasted a year and quarter and that ended a long time ago. Mm. Would you buy a ticket? Um, and against all of this, um, <laughs> Michal, stop. It's the end of the long term. It's very long, very long season. Um, against all of this, we have the Taoiseach saying that within uh, its lifetime, the government's what, got about a year and a half left? Yeah. So within the lifetime of this government and with uh, local and European elections to come next year, the government is going to finally sort out, bite the bullet of funding public service broadcasting. We've, we've heard before from some sources within the Department of the Media that the government wasn't far off dealing with this issue, that work had been done. So when a pause was put on the question of putting RT's funding on a, on a firmer um, stage that this was an awful lot of the hard work had been done. So I think that explains part of the reason why the Taoiseach was so definitive on that, that it is, he said it would be unfair to load it up onto another government that this is something that this coalition will deal with. So once again, the question is timing. When do they deem that it's appropriate and right? And one would imagine that's only going to happen after the external reviews are completed, and that could be March of next year. Right into the locals. In Vote winner. <laughs> And in the meantime, and again, uh, Kevin Backhurst and some of the RTE executives uh, were asked about this, the the new head of advertising as well. Uh, you know, how's the advertising holding up? How's the sponsorship yeah. holding up? Uh, the autumn will be the test. Uh, how's the license fee payments holding yeah. up? So there, there could be, and again, uh, politicians also kind of acknowledging this, aren't they? There could be a need in the meantime before this bullet gets bitten on funding of public service broadcast and there could be a need for an RTE bailout. Yeah, yeah. The, the kind of indications were that revenue was holding okay, wasn't it, up to now, that, but... For the month uh, of June. Yeah, I mean, conceding that when it comes to the licence, I think Kevin Backer's words were that things could get a bit bumpy. Yeah, and things... But at the same time, the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar was addressing the Fine Gael Parliamentary Party last night and he was talking about conditionality applying to any extra money which could be given to RT in the context of the budget should those revenues fall off. But I spoke to a number of Fine Gael TDs, and that was the official readout, but I spoke to a number of Fine Gael TDs who attended that meeting and said it wasn't quite as stark as that. It was just, this is the, it's a process, this is the way it's mm -hmm. done, rather than it being a 
hand on yeah. hips moment yeah. and a well, bit is, of a demand. Is he reassuring his own party there that if anything were to happen that there would be safeguards or is he sending a message to RTE that if we have to probably two things about, at the yeah. same time? I should look the BDI of the Controller and Auditor General I mean that that's to me has been one of the really interesting mm, things about yes. this process the attention that the Controller and Auditor General who has sat through so many of those mm. meetings uh, in fact even at one stage today uh, able to clarify something that, that the Richard Collins yes the Chief Richard Financial Collins Officer again, was could unclear not clarify, on. Yes. Yeah. That was the, if you take the 120,000 over the period 2017 to 2019 in the Ryan earnings, and if you just take 20,000 straight off 2017, that it's the figure still doesn't come in quite right, Brian Stanley said. But Seamus McCarthy put his hand up while others were struggling and said he had a theory on that. It was something to do about the, the start point and the contract. The calendar year and the year uh, yeah. and the contract timings and being out on that explained the 34,000 that Brian There's uh, a man Stanley. who knows, who's a serious handle on RT's finances already. There's a man who's making lots of notes mm. with a careful expectation maybe that he's the one who's going to be overseeing it. And a really sure. interesting point uh, he made Same. because we, we did actually hear him talk at a couple of points during today's uh, hearing. It, as you say, those questions are, uh, were being put to him. Uh, but the c and AG making the point that the RTE board can appoint an outside auditor. That's within their competence. So if they wanted, they could rock up and say to the c and AG, we want you to come in and audit RTE. But he told the Public Accounts Committee, the C&AG, uh, he believes it would require legislative change. So again, it would seem to indicate somebody who, if they are to be invigilating RTE, yes. uh, wants to know that they have the full legal authority to do so. Yeah, and that's a low hurdle. I don't know any government or opposition party is going to say no to that. So but the, the minister has mentioned that in the statements in RT yes. two weeks ago that that mightn't be a bad idea and if there's cross party the support. Has spoken yeah. about it as well. And, and but I suppose uh, in the meantime he does have a degree of power over RT as a result of that nod from the doll a few weeks ago. So he can look at the books a lot more closely at the moment even already which is a change compared to what it was a few weeks ago. He's the permanent representative, yeah. the permanent guest of the public Which is the way committee. it was up to, to 1990 wasn't yeah. it? Speaking of money um Billions and billions for the children's hospital and later and later for the delivery. But no surprise to a certain extent um, that we hear this, this for more delays at the National Children's Hospital. Unfortunately, the bill is going up. But even for me, it was a little bit stark when we learned on Monday that um, the amount involved, the, the increase in claims from BAM, which is the uh, constructor, was 110 million in six months. Um, and that was something which... It was stark, but what was probably even stark was the fact that the hospital board and the contractor are so divided. There's a gulf between mm -hmm. them now. There is no faith. There is no trust. Um, if, but if you're looking for a chink of light, it is that um, a programme of works is going to be produced by BAM, they say, by next week. And that should give us a line of sight as to when this project is ultimately going to be finished. The question yeah. of how much it's ultimately going to cost. It, listen, it's over two billion. The government hasn't wanted to say that. They seem to be edging closer to it because ultimately, with all of these additional claims being made by BAM, they justify them by saying there's been changes to the design. But that's going to go into some form of negotiation. And the sooner we get to that point, um, the better. Uh, yes, it's just... So your size is a lot. I remember uh, th this has gone on. I remember Bertie Ahern talking about this. Do you remember when there was the big row about the matter and the matter yeah. site wasn't suitable and there Traffic. was a design for the matter site and yada yada. I think it's 30 years in total, isn't it? The very first idea in sort of 30 years in the making. And by the time it finally opens its doors, mm. I mean, wh what did Pierce Doherty say the other day? We could have had three children's hospitals for the cost of, of, of the one that's going to get. It does look beautiful. And actually, if you're standing in the Phoenix Park and you look across, yeah. you can see it on the Dublin skyline and it looks absolutely amazing. But only, what did the board say the other day? Only 27 of the 3,000 rooms that was supposed to be ready. Now, some of them are close to it. So it's, it's, when you say 27, it's been, it's been inspected and it's vouched for and that's it. So there's the a lot more. the ones that they had the ventilation problems in. No, that was the theatres. The theaters. Oh, that was the theatres. So. But I mean, like someone like just to talk, speak to your earlier point, um, the independent TD Matt Shanahan will have been on Twitter describing it as a white elephant and speaking to that point that this money would have been better spent on smaller projects. That's not accepted by the majority in the, in the Doyle. They say the de design and costings and, and 
has been a disaster, but the hospital itself will really fulfil a function for, for the children of Ireland. Yeah. The unfortunate thing is that some of the children who could have helped are now adults. You see, one of the difficulties, what, what do you do if you run into problems? You know, if you're building your home and you have, you, you know, you end up, your, your builder isn't doing what you want them to do and they're not doing it fast enough and it's become much more expensive. What do you do at that stage? I mean, you could try suing them. You could try getting another builder. But like those options aren't available to government, are they, on a project of this size? No, I suppose they will point out that many claims before that when they have gone into mediation or whatever, they have reduced considerably. But, yes. it, but, it, but it's the deadline here. And I suppose the unofficial deadline on all this really is that probable election in the early part of 2025. And if the TD, the government could go out. Or late without, 24. Yeah. And the Taoiseach had said only a few weeks ago that they expected the first patients to be treated at some point in 2024 but if they go out to the electorate without the hospital done in 2025 that's that's a bit of a problem all right isn't it politically so as this political turn wraps up looking back and looking forward Michal well I suppose looking forward the next bit will be defined in large part by the boundary reviews of the constituencies and you could have 20 plus extra TDs making their way back possibly into in 2025 on the basis of population on growth. the basis of population yeah and I suppose at this point next year things probably do begin to change after the locals as well I think quite clearly that Michal Martin will become the country's next commissioner at this point next year so the next the next while is is, is significant in that regard yeah, there's that you can really notice kind of an extra confidence, can't you? And Michael McGraw lately, he he very much looks much more like I a think leader there are in the doesn't he? The surface, and if RTE hadn't uh, rolled its way into the political system here and controlled everything, there would be definitely a focus in the last few weeks of this doll and Michael McGrath and looking as well, is there a possible link up there between himself and Jack Chambers as a one two ticket uh, to go before Fianna Fall at some point next year if Michael Martin does go to Europe? And besides all of that, the big issue occupying politicians' minds by the autumn will be the budget? Absolutely. Um, the budget, given we've got so many millions and billions in the state coffers, what is it that the state wants to do? The government is trying to say... Want to do everything, Paul. Well, yeah, exactly. And be prudent. Be prudent. What was that? You had a great line on the podcast last time, or it was actually David Murphy when he was, Michael McGraw was explaining that it wasn't a rule, but it wasn't a hard rule. Yeah, the spending limit, which they're going to break. Yeah. 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 So it was a lovely Irish, you know, I know but it's a rule, but how far money, can you break you can, it? You can be prudent and flahulic all at once, can't you? Yeah, and, uh, and Michael McGraw was like saying that was based would have on what, once. 2 to 3% inflation and inflation's been running at 8% although it is coming back. But so is this something that. uniquely Irish? I remember like when I was, um, I studied German in secondary school and I went for a school um, trip and I must have been 14 or 15. The first morning I was trying to ingratiate myself with the family so I said I'd go down and buy a paper. And I went to the end of the street in Sella near Hanover and there was like Saturday morning, no cars. So I went across the road, as you do, and then I suddenly got yanked from the back of my jacket and there was a small woman and she you just looked at me were you? and she said, this is forbidden, yeah. which means it is you forbidden. Don't, yeah, you don't jaywalk in A rule Germany. is a rule. Yeah. Black, yeah. white. Why is it that we have um, rules and then we've got not really hard rules yeah. and soft rules and which side we love the grey. We love the grey. Which side home did you buy? <laughs> 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 I just remember, I was trying, can I remember the word, German word? It wasn't built anyway. Yeah, 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 I just... Just about him. As I said, I we're going Frank to be... Frankfurt or Alamein, I think it was. Well, that keeps oh, the actually, political system nimble as well at the same time, doesn't it? I mean, they say in the 70s when Ireland joined Europe, it was able to implement stuff quickly because it's... Could it's blame someone else. Well, it's nimble, you know? Yeah. And <laughs> um, you have to be nimble coming into the door these days, actually. Politicians and reporters are finding that some of the protesters that are there. Yeah, it's a bit heated. It's, it's, it's more heated than usual uh, and, and a degree of abuse and people being followed. Uh, something that was raised at the Fianna Fáil Parliamentary Party meeting last night. It, it's, it's unclear how that, that can be resolved, but there definitely is a change in tone. Yeah, I'm just reading, I got a text from one who, who's told the meeting that driving a car through the gates of Thorland is becoming extremely stressful despite the best efforts of Gardaí. Um, many of these groups tend to move out and come back in in front of your car and it's frightening to be behind, be behind the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever and we saw people, that footage of Holly Cairns being chased up the street yeah, as well. You, was, you, you've been subject to these I was going to, to say, kind of things, even yeah. whatever about cars, it's the people who are on foot. And um, I know that the female members um, are finding this particularly difficult to deal with as well. So um, it is a problem. And... Um, in the words of Marco Cossie, good morning, Ireland this morning. You what know. we do with our Marco Cossie? He's got loads of mentions today. Yeah. We'll have to put a bar on him then for six, six weeks. But he said it had to be tackled. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we'll see uh, what happens. It's going to be a lot quieter around here anyway uh, in the weeks. Uh, Although I was hearing that some in government were threatening a cabinet meeting on August 1st, but that won't happen. Do you want to put it on that? Absolutely. What about committees? 
there's some loads of them. They always say, we're prepared to meet through the summer. Yeah. And fair play to the Public Accounts Committee. They were back in p- private session this afternoon. They've had a long and busy I day. I wonder what yes, the attendance yeah. like that was compared to the public <laughs> session. I don't know. I just wonder. <laughs> Me hold your devil. Okay, as I said, we're going to be I with you. The, the, the grand thornton report into the 2017 to 2019 and like property payments. If that were to get published in the next week or so, I think at least one committee would come back for that. Yes, maybe the media one. So it may not be all over yet. We certainly will be talking about this for a while to come, and we'll talk to you again next week. Thanks for listening. Talk soon.